What are we still giving uh, people about two minutes, one minute? Okay, I'm live then, so I guess uh, we'll get started. This presentation is about maximizing the return on investment for your vulnerability management program. It's a very long-winded title because uh, I was in a rush. So when we finally get down to it, we'll reduce it somewhat. <coughs> My name is Carol Fenley. I'm the Director of Content and Documentation for Tenable Network Security. Uh, I've also been a technical writer for a lot of years on various topics in the information security field. And I'm the editor of the CIS Solaris 10 benchmark. That's a consensus benchmark for Solaris systems. And co-founder of Hacker Court presentation at uh, Black Hat every year. Uh, when I was developing this paper, um, I started developing it as a paper because writing comes more naturally to me than just trying to extemporaneously getting my thoughts out. So one of my colleagues at Tenable, Brian Martin, who's um, also associated with attrition.org, data loss, and OSBDB, gave me a lot of his insights, which was pretty valuable. Um, we also got insights from our CEO, Ron Gula. So the paper started developing into this very lengthy paper of 24 pages. So rather than bore you with all 24 pages, I've also realized that we got some consensus information from John Klein, who's rolling out a vulnerability management program at Broadridge. So with all this information, I realized that we've got a pretty talented group of people here. So what I'd like to do is go through the highlights of what we developed for the paper. And the paper is going to be available on the Tenable website, so people can download it, look at it, comment, tell us what we're right or wrong with, and um, help us turn it into a consensus industry paper that's vendor neutral and hopefully will give people good insights on how to develop their vulnerability management program. So overview of vulnerability management um, and return on investment. Businesses spend money to make money. That's the whole premise of return on investment. It's okay to invest money as long as you're getting something back for it. So you've got a choice of how the money's going to be spent. You can develop a proactive vulnerability management program with all the pieces in place, or you can just pay for the cost of a data breach. And as the uh, data loss guys have shown us, oops, wrong one. We are all, a lot of us are familiar with these big incidents of data loss, and all of these have a cost associated with them. I've seen various numbers associated with $100 per data record lost, and I don't think that's really accurate. But it's sufficient to say that there is a cost associated with loss of uh, consumer data. So you can either spend money with these kinds of losses, or you can do something about it. And just so you know, these are not isolated incidents. The data loss statistics are gathered every day. There's new situations, and um, it's been ongoing. So vulnerability management programs have different goals. It really depends on what your goal is, how effective your program is going to be. Some people have the goal of just meeting the minimum requirements of compliance checklist. Just what do I need to do to get past my compliance? Or just get the clean scan. You know, just run the scan so that it's clean so that I can show that our network is clean. Another goal, and the one that I think is more effective, of course, is to just secure your systems. Create a vulnerable, proactive vulnerability management program that's going to ensure that my systems are secure. And part of my argument with this is that if you do the second one, the first one will follow. Typical problems in vulnerability management programs, and these are the ones typically that are set up to just meet compliance requirements, is that there's no corporate direction. They haven't defined a clear-cut policy of what they want. There isn't a defined process, and they haven't gotten a consensus between the business IT and security people. They just usually tip, tell the security guys, just make it secure. Just go buy some tools and make this all happen. This leads to the blind men and the elephant metaphor. Everybody's got a different picture of the importance of data. The business guys will be looking at the data for what it is, how important it is to them. The IT guys typically are looking at operating system issues and making sure that nobody gets root. Whereas the audit guys may be auditing a system and they see a vulnerability, but it's not on a system that matters. So you need to achieve a consensus so that everybody's got the same picture of what the goals are. Other typical problems, lack of resources. Um, first is usually insufficient funding to buy the tools and the appropriate 
supporting infrastructure. Um, that isn't quite as prevalent as the more serious problem, which I think is getting qualified staffing to deploy, manage, and maintain the tools. If you don't have the organization to support the program, you can have the tools all sit on the shelf and nobody really use them effectively. Other typical problems, ineffective scanning. A lot of organizations are looking for a clean scan. Just show me everything works. And they also may only be looking for vulnerabilities. You've got a vulnerability scanner going out there on the network. It's got a lot of opportunities. It's getting pictures of what data is out there. It's looking f it can find a lot more information than just vulnerabilities. For example, um, patch audits. If you are patching systems, you might have a program that's going out to see them. A lot of times you'll get false positives with these programs because the patch may not have actually deployed correctly. It may have started the process, so you think everything's fine, but a security issue, power failure, firewall blockage, or some other thing could have kept the patch from completing. So a vulner vulnerability scanner can actually go out there and check to see if the patch was actually deployed. Another issue with patches is you run a scan looking for patches, but and it comes back clean. What if it's an older platform? I mean, unless anybody running Windows 95 or something, but there are platforms that are no longer supported, so there's no patches written for them. Doesn't mean there's no vulnerabilities for them. Another issue is relying on antivirus programs. Lots of people think their antivirus is sufficient to protect them from attack. However, antivirus doesn't plug the attack, actual attack vector. It might prevent a malicious site from spreading the latest Trojan to your vulnerable web browser, but it won't stop a custom exploit designed to grant access to your network from the outside. Also, your antivirus system might have vulnerabilities itself. So it's important to scan the systems with antivirus systems, make sure they're deployed, running, updated, and that if they have been updated, the system's been rebooted to put the updates into effect. One issue that we've also found is some scanners support the use of credentials to do scans. Credential scans can give you a lot more information about the system. Typical network scan is only getting a picture from the outside. It's not seeing what the system is doing inside. If you're using credentials on a scan, you can get information about the hardware drivers on that system. You can get information about configuration issues that might not be vulnerabilities, but they can still lead to problems. You can find things that aren't yet vulnerabilities on the system that can hit you down the road. So there's a lot more information that you can get from that. If your scanner's going out there anyway, let it pick up as much data. The problem with it picking up as much data is that some people don't want to have to deal with all the data. So there's been discussions in um, a lot of the talks here about identifying assets. And this is a management job. The technical people just know what they've got. You need to know which, what you're trying to protect, what's important to your systems. Your technology doesn't have ESP. It doesn't know what servers and what data is more important to you. So you need to create asset lists that defines what your critical business servers are, your infrastructure devices, and what's just a, maybe a test system that you don't care if it gets uh, attacks on it. If you can group these all together in organizational lists, that helps mitigating the problems that are most critical to your organization a lot easier. The other issue is to classify data, and Amit Yoren had some comments about this this morning. What, what is your data? Are you just going to look at all the data on your network as the same importance? That's going to take a lot of time. It's going to give you a lot of reports to look through. You, if you classify the data, then you can know which areas of the network things like credit card data are supposed to be on and not supposed to be on. Then you can tune scanners to mon monitor the network appropriately. But this all has to be done from the business side and trying to get the business people to come up with a program that does this, classifies and labels data appropriately is sometimes tough. Before you put out and buy tools or even look at tools, you really should be developing a vulnerability management blueprint, something that shows what are all your requirements and what are you going to need to have in place to support the program. It's going to be beyond just having a tool and the systems to support the tools. You need to identify what the business requirements are 
get the business units involved, find out what is important to them and how their systems are set up. What are the technical requirements for the program? Are you going to need to get more servers in there? Are you going to need to segregate the network and come up with um, mappings of data flows? What are the product requirements for implementation? Uh, scanning and reporting process, uh, operational requirements, I'm sorry. You're going to buy this and somebody's got to run it and maintain it, otherwise it's not very useful. Scanning and reporting process. You need to set up scan schedules and a way to deliver reports to the appropriate people. Budget, of course, production costs, staff hours, and roles and responsibilities. Who's going to do what in the process? It's strongly recommended you get people from the business units involved who will have a relationship with people to get the information about the reports. And finally, you also need a method to get metrics to show how effective the program is going to be. So analyzing solutions. Look at whatever, what is already in-house. But the important thing is you don't want to tailor the program to what your tools are. You may have something in-house that works. You may have something that will integrate very well with other tools you want to bring in. Is it supported on and can scan multiple platforms? How scalable is it? Do the features of it align with technical and business requirements? What's the cost, both one-time and recurring cost? I've seen solutions that on the outset look like they're expensive solutions, but uh, then as time goes by, their maintenance isn't very high. On the other hand, I've seen other solutions that seem to be reasonably priced, but by the third year, you're so embedded with that system and cost and maintenance keeps going up. What's the long-term viability of the product? Um, it's nice to get a product with lots of little features, but if it doesn't have a very long lifespan and hasn't had a lot of people supporting it, then is it going to be around long term in your program? You don't want to go through the effort of rolling out something that six months later is going to be out of business. What's the update process? And this is really important. Uh, I've seen lots of situations where people have had to manually update plugins to scanners and they very quickly get out of date. The more automated the process is to update information on your scanner, the more accurate it will be and the less headaches and support hours it's going to cost. What's the learning curve? Can it, you get it up and running pretty quickly? Are you going to need a lot of inf you know, staff effort and training to learn how to use this product? And what can it break? Um, most of, anything can break anything, um, just if you use it wrong. But how likely is it to break things on your network and how easy is it to configure it to run in a safer mode until you get more familiar with how the product runs. How effective and flexible is the reporting? Uh, reports, as we'll get into later, have to be tailored to different organizations and might need to be put out in different ways depending on what information you want to get across. And finally, who else uses it? This is sort of a um, copying everybody else kind of thing, but if it's well known in the industry and well used in the industry, there's more chance that they've gotten a lot of feedback on it and gotten a lot of input on the products. So hopefully they've listened. Solution analysis. Uh, third party solutions. Uh, you can look at managed services. Um, what's your managed service going to cost? They'll own the solution, not you. Do they own the data? What kind of reportings do they get back to you? Penetration testing, uh, lots of organizations require penetration testing by third parties or vulnerability assessments, and I've done a lot with that, but that's another subject. If you have a good in-house solution, you can give the penetration teams and audit teams reports on what you've done, or at the very least, you can anticipate what they are likely to find in the audit reports. Less time you spend in meetings, happier everybody is. In-house situations that these are things that you, your vulnerability management program can actually help out with that you wouldn't really expect. And one of the things we're saying here is go beyond vulnerabilities and look at how your solution can help with other things that you need to do. For example, almost everybody's got a patch management system. How can your vulnerability scanning or vulnerability management system help with this? Well, you can set your scanner to go out and make sure that the patches actually have been applied, not just you think they started, you started the process, so we hope it's fine. They can also check to make sure any necessary reboots have occurred after the patch updates. If reboot hasn't occurred, chances are the patch isn't effective right now. Other situations is configuration management. 
You establish gold standards, and CIS Benchmarks, which I do some editing for, has various standards. But it's important for you to take standards and develop them and tailor them to your organization. Some of the issue I've got with check marks and benchmarks is that this is a best guess, sort of like a shopping list. I send my son to the store, I say, here's a list of things I need for dinner, and he might come back with it, and he might not have everything that I was anticipating. He's not going to realize maybe something was on sale that I wanted if I saw it. So any of these configuration gold standards are suggestions. You have to look at what your actual needs are and tell them to your situation. Your vulnerability scanner can go out there and then having this information, check the systems. Another advantage to having gold standards is that more consistency in the way you've configured your systems makes them much, much easier to maintain. Um, another area that I've done a lot of work with is incident response. Good vulnerability management system is invaluable in incident response. If you've got a security information management system that's got all your information consolidated in one part, one easy to use console, very, very quickly can get to the information that not only shows you what vulnerabilities you might be subjected to, it also can give you a topology on your network, um, information about trends, maybe even those little anomalies that occurred a few weeks before that you didn't pay attention to then, but now turn out to be the attack vector. So definitely needs to be tied into your incident response system. Another area that you might not be aware of is software development. If your software developers are using scanning tools in their own organization as they go through the development process, it's easier for them to identify potential vulnerabilities in products that they're using in their development cycle that could affect later on. It's much, much easier and more cost effective to fix these at the development stage than after the product's gone out the door. Motivations to deploy. A lot of times people do the analysis to look at various solutions and they don't actually want to pull the trigger. They buy the products, it sits on the shelf, and that's it. And if you don't deploy it, it's not much use. So often this is the motivation to deploy. Your systems have gotten hacked. But hopefully you'll deploy your systems before you have something like this happen because this isn't a fun way to um, get motivated to deploy your systems. For deployment, first thing that's important is establish a baseline. This is your initial scanning. And don't worry if you've got a lot of vulnerabilities. As a matter of fact, that's fine. Uh, business units might be concerned you found all these problems. It's a baseline. It can only get better from here. At least you hope so if your system's effective. So establish that baseline. Set your scanners to find as much information as they can. And use that as a way to show progress in the program. And you sh will show progress, I hope. Tune the scanning parameters. My colleague Brian is very particular about this. He's currently working on the Nessus 4 development and is constantly working on how he can scan, tune things better to make his scans very comprehensive, but also cut down the noise. Um, what good is it if I'm seeing hammering a system with hundreds and hundreds of database uh, vulnerability checks if there's no database on that system? Or hitting a uh, firewall with web server exploits when there's no web server on the firewall. So tune your scan to be appropriate. You want a comprehensive, complete, but you also want to limit all those false positives so that you can really analyzes the data and you've got good data. Scan scheduling. Nobody likes surprise scans. Nobody likes scans that interrupt business. I was working in a large financial at one point where they had scans going on middle of a trading day that was killing all of the systems that were responsible for trading systems. That's not good. That gets people really annoyed at you really fast. Work with the business units to come up with a scan schedule. Sometimes you might have to deal with change management organizations. It depends on what your business requirements are. But the IT guys can't do this in a vacuum. You've got to talk to all the business units, find out what works for them. Many scanning systems can be set up for automated scans, set a time, and it'll do it. But make sure somebody's analyzing depending on what you've got going, especially the first time. Correlate all the results. If you're doing more than scanning, if you've got a full comprehensive vulnerability management system, you're going to have a lot of security devices out there sending information into the security event management system. IDS, firewall logs, NetFlow data, um, a lot of different sources coming through. 
look at all the results from things. Sometimes you can see patterns by taking all this data and looking at it together. Something that wouldn't seem too much of an incident or wouldn't flag an alert for one thing, it, taken in com combination with something else or another activity, can show you um, more subtle attacks. And good hackers do subtle attacks. Analyze the results. Use standard reporting templates for vulnerability reports with detailed risk reports and summary risk reports. This provides a mechanism for consistent reporting of information and realize that anyone can, not anyone can read a vulnerability report. Well, anybody can read it, not everybody can understand it. In the analyzation part, you need to look at it and then boil this information down to generate a report that your management can understand. It, executive management doesn't want to hear, unless you're Ron, uh, finger D is on this system. Because they don't know what it means, usually. You accept it. Um, they want to hear, I've got a critical issue, and uh, what am I doing about it? They want the red light, you know, red, green, yellow type of thing. Your technical people will want the reports with all the details. Um, because they're the ones that understand the significance of it. Um, John and I worked together at TIA Craft. We had this massive report from a third party um, company, one of the big audit companies, that said, oh, you've got a root kit. And I'm like, that's a Cisco router. How do we have a root kit on a Cisco router? So work with the technical people so that you really look at the scanning results and see what it really means. And then come up with a comprehensive report. The scanner knows it's making the best guess about what's on the situation. Does, don't just use the scanner's interpretation of the significance of that result. Use your own insight into what's important. Um, actually, I said communicate results already. So, Mitigation and remediation. All of this effort is useless if you don't do something about it. So you know you've got vulnerable systems. You need to do something to make it better, to fix all the problems. A lot of times this involves getting the business units involved because you can tell them they've got vulnerabilities month after month and if they're not doing anything about it, what's the point of the program? Develop service level agreements with these business units and come up with penalties. Get executive management to work on that and this is why you need executive management guidelines on the program. Make sure that they are held responsible. If you do the follow-up scan the next month and you're every month getting the same things that aren't fixed, you need to raise a red flag and you need to show how long this has gone without being uh, fixed. Um, mitigation remediation, I should point out, are different things. Sometimes it's, you know, patch it, fix it. Or sometimes it could be, we can't do that right now. We are taking these other measures, whether it's increased monitoring or whatever, to mitigate the, or remediate the problem. Develop trending reports. This is important to show that you're doing your job. Show the trending reports over time to show one, the status, status versus risk metric. Status metrics is how far you've rolled out the program into the organization and how long it's spreading. Risk metrics is how many high, critical, um, medium, and low vulnerabilities you have. So develop the trending reports, get that up to management, and communicate that the program is effective. Wow, I'm at the conclusion already. Okay. Compliance requirements. Provide useful checklists to make sure you've addressed specific security concerns, but don't base your entire vulnerability management program on compliance checklists, because if you have a proactive vulnerability management system, you'll be addressing the business needs, you'll be taking care of the security issues, and as a side effect, you'll probably be compliant. Now, as part of this, in working on the paper, I was, um, talking to John Klein, who is rolling out such a program at Broadridge, and, uh, oh, wrong one, sorry. I had it down here. Thank you. And we were coming up with a table and a paper that we'll make available on the Tenable website and by comments on and input on that discusses these details in a lot more detail. Um, but one of the things we came up with is we had a table that we were mapping NIST requirements for um, DOD requirements to mitigating factors. What was interesting is I took this table and ran it past John's group, which is in the financial field, and they're not subject to NIST requirements. So I was curious to see 
They've rolled out this vulnerability management program. How does their program map to what NISTRI and DOD is requiring? And not only did they map to it, they actually added a lot of data to all of these controls. So there are a lot of compliance requirements that are out there. And actually, if you look at this, this goes on for pages and pages and pages. And this will be available in the paper if anybody would like that. That will show certain things like um, auto retention and various things that are not necessarily what you call vulnerability system. These security assessments obviously are. But these are things that are not, strictly speaking, vulnerability management requirements, but your program can help support these things. So it's interesting to find all these requirements and see how a well thought out vulnerability management program can map to this. Um, it gets a little frightening when you see all of the compliance requirement checklists out there, and I think SANS is now trying to come up with another list of check marks, but it's really not all that frightening. You have a big, pro a well thought out program, you can meet all of these and come out with a mapping system similar to this. If you're updating your program, you'll be updating any of the mapping system. So, uh, sorry. How do I get back to the full? There it was. Okay. So at this point, what I'd like to do is open up to what? Okay. I'd like to open up to any questions or comments on what anybody thinks would be useful to add, change, what? So um, to kind of add on to where you talked about the tie-in of the program to the software development lifecycle, so while it is advantageous to push the tools out to the developers and get them to scan early in the process, um, we're also making use of the vulnerability scanning to look for trends and the types of vulnerabilities. Um, if I'm seeing the same kind of vulnerabilities across application after application after application, that gives me a pretty good idea. I've got a systemic problem in the company that I've got developers creating doing the same mistakes. And so I can use that to try to change behavior of the developers and get them to write better applications and then use the follow-up scans to see if those kinds of vulnerabilities stop showing up. So you could tie it much deeper into the software development lifecycle and, and try to nip the problem as early on as possible. How many people here are responsible for rolling out vulnerability management programs? OK, what problems uh, anybody want to share? What problems they typically see? Yeah, and a lot of those uh, issues about the process and responsibility is out of the hands of the technical people, because executive management has to tell everybody and enforce the fact that you've got to cooperate with this, you've got to work with this and roll out the program. But unfortunately, what happens a lot of times is they say, just go buy some tools and make the system secure. You got a comment, John? Yeah, I, I'd say the, the biggest challenge is selling the program. Um, I spent the better part of the last few months um, pretty much eliminating what existed, which was just a couple of tools in the program, creating a program, and then creating a market because selling to senior management is just valuable with this. Where it's going to save us money, um, you know, where it's going to improve our processes and make our customers' data more secure. Um, so the better you can sell this program, the easier it is to get the funding. And I've had no problem getting funding for it. Um, and the easier it is to get buy-in to actually implement 
Yes. Be part, I'm sorry. Be part salesperson. Okay. Yes. A lot of that is going to be diplomatic relationships with the business units and trying to work with them and show them how you can improve their processes and streamline their work, which means you don't want to have, create an adversarial thing like, oh, here's all the things you're doing wrong. You want to get them involved in the process early and try to show them how it will benefit them. If they're a software development organization, you can say, we just want to help you, you know, uncover these things earlier so that you're, Q you're reducing the time on your QA cycles. Um, you also want to avoid trying to make it adversarial of, um, well, we're just going to embarrass you to all the rest of the organizations to try to make it cooperative. Um, John, you probably have some comments yeah, on this. Some, some, of the, uh, yeah, so some of those business people are so thick-headed that the only way to get their attention is to demonstrate it to them. So either you know, getting a third-party assessor to break into the application or just getting a copy uh, for yourself and demonstrating that here's what could happen. And it's better that I show it to you than a bad guy show it to you. Actually, the bad guy shows it to you, he's taking the box with him. John had one of my favorite stories. He used to work on a trading floor at Morgan Stanley doing, trying to sell security back before they had firewalls and people wanted to get things out on the network. And uh, one of the traders goes, well, why do I need a firewall? What the hell is this firewall? Why do I need this? And he had one of the Sun systems and then, you know, stole the guy's screen from his system, put it onto his and says, what's on the gray list this week? The guy went pale, picked up the phone and said, you're not doing anything until we have a firewall in place. You need to demonstrate to them in clear terms they can understand what can happen. Um, you don't want to be creating a lot of what we call FUD and sky is falling kind of things because then nobody listens to you. But um, sites like Data Loss provides great material and um, it's sort of like a situation of reading the obituaries and trying to make sure you're not dead yet. You know, tell management, do you really want to see your company on this list? Do you want your boss to see your company on this list? Um, you don't want to be the one responsible for that kind of information. So, awareness helps. Putting it in terms that mean something to them. And you guys do a great job with data loss. So, Thank especially you. your graphs, Dave. <laughs> Comments, questions, thoughts on what works? Yes. I mean, it seems like the, the problem here is you're trying to advocate a really philosophical change in terms of you know, telling management you need to have an active role with vulnerability management. Telling software development, you know, you guys need to do security now, which is clearly some of the acquisitions in the space we've seen that. I mean, I guess I don't really have a question so much as, you know, I'm curious how, you know, again, experts think that you sort of, to your point, provide the crumbs that are going to lead these, you know, constituencies down this path where necessarily they don't want to go and they haven't had to go in the past. I mean, what's, what's the advice? I think you touched on some of it that you give the, the people in that position. Well, you also want to show that your vulnerability scanner can go uh, far beyond just finding vulnerabilities. You know, if you're just looking at for software bugs, you're kind of limiting. It's sort of like um, the example of sending my son up to the store because I need butter because I'm making garlic bread or something. I know it's near dinner time. Um, but while you're at it, you know, you're making the trip anyway. Could you pick up, you know, beer or something else? Um, it's while you're going there, while the network scan's going out there, you might not want it to do as comprehensive a check as you'd schedule for at another time, but while it's out there, why can't it go out there and find out information about, um, you know, all the hardware on the system? That helps in your inventory process. That's not necessarily vulnerability, but it can add to your entire program. Uh, anybody ever have to go out there and inventory all the hardware on all their systems, and it's tedious. But while you've got the scanner, why not let the scanner do a little bit more than it may have been designed to do, or it might have been designed to do, and it can find more than just um, bugs. It can get a lot of great information. 
and also use the other tools and correlate it to find things about new devices that are showing up on your network that um, could violate a policy. Um, one of the types of scannings that we do is um, passive network vulnerability scanning, which I worked on Wall Street. And uh, if you've worked Wall Street, you had to deal with the freeze at the end of the year. So you can't do any scanning. You can't do anything on the network, no changes whatsoever. It's very heavily locked down. But if you had something like passive scanning in place, you'd be able to see det uh, violations to that policy because you'd be able to find who put a new device on the network in violation of the freeze policy or what new traffic, what malicious traffic is running around. So there's a lot more information that you can get than just vulnerabilities. John. Oh, yeah. So, so on the other side of that, you can look at it, no matter what program it is, whether it's vulnerability management or I want a firewall thing or IDS thing, it's showing the value. And so by demonstrating to the organization the value of the program, whether it's you know, developers making their jobs easier, um, I find a lot of it from my side is around contract liability. You know, if our clients are saying we have to be you know, keep the data secure and here are the penalties for breach, well, the vulnerability management program is helping me reduce the risk so that we don't find ourselves in a situation where data has been breached and now we're shelling out hundreds of millions of dollars in damages. So, uh, and, and by getting into other parts of the organization with the program, you know, the developers, if we fix the problems earlier, you know, as your lead developer, you don't have to go fix them in production, which now you have to delay new features because you're going back and retrofitting. And oh, by the way, if you teach your guys how to write better code, better, more secure code, then you won't run into these problems. And it's going to make your guys more efficient. You're going to waste less time. You'll be more productive. You'll save money. So when they start seeing the value and see that you're willing to work with them, they're much more interested in getting involved than if you just use it as a bludgeon and say, thou shalt do this or, you know, sulfur will rain, fiery sulfur will rain down upon you. That, that just doesn't seem to work. Other comments, sir? Yes. Uh, how about scanning for the time crash? I mean, there's all the ways you can do it. You said, go out and check for this other thing since you're going out to check for something. What about looking at the files of finding credit card numbers or social security numbers? Credential scans can be used to get more information on the systems about the kind of data that's on the system. Um, network scanning, pa passive scanning that I mentioned, can be used to sniff data that's tra traversing the network. So if you've got your network configured properly where you're saying that um, you know, things like credit card data can't be in the DMZ, you can have s passive scanning set up to monitor that information and say, wait a minute, we're recognizing this type of data. Or you can be looking at VPN data to make sure it's encrypted. Or sometimes encrypted data could show that you've got a problem. Why, is, why do we have this encrypted stream going on to somebody else? What's all the ins instant messenger data going out to some guy in Russia? So um, both from a network's point of view and a file system point of view, you can look at what type of data is going around on the network. And that was where we got into data classification of you first have to identify what is type of data you're allowing on your network, where it's allowed on your network, and then you can tune the systems to look for this type of violations and generate alerts on it. Did you have any comments on to add or? Oh, I mean, it's, it's usually if you're going to uh, block the file system from a scanner, uh, one thing you've got to worry about is how much impact on that system you have, right? If you're going to search the entire contract with a you know, 10 terabyte server, do you have to move 10 terabytes back to your scanner? A lot of products out there that'll leak it, you know, right. that can do this and do this and that. And uh, I think if you can fold it into some sort of vulnerability management or asset classification program, you're never going to need that much of that. Other comments, thoughts, questions? Yes? Can you talk about uh, maybe some of the things we might see in vulnerability management as it evolves? I mean, scanning has been around a while, and you know, there's the passive scanning and stuff, but what might be some of the other things that, that either you folks work on? Can I defer that to you? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, one thing you're not going to see is uh, click here and, and configure myself and hash myself and don't break anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so something like, uh, I don't know if you guys have to the government, but in the government this program called FDCC, right? So NIST is basically saying if you have Windows Vista or Windows uh, XP Pro, you have to have about 700 or so different settings that are configured a certain way, right? And if you talk to anybody from NIST, they're very proud to tell you that they worked with Microsoft 
and they got like 50 or 60 different settings in Vista to be set out of the box already in this compliant, right? But what about the other, you know, couple hundred that Microsoft basically said no to, right? Microsoft did a risk calculation on that and said, hey, you know, we, we, we can't configure all this, it might break, Outlook might break, you know, who knows, my VPN client or different things like that. Um, but what I think you're going to see down the road is much, much more integration of things. I mean, you talk to any vendor, uh, they're trying to integrate more things into what they check. And you talk to any management vendor, whether they're antivirus or a configuration manager, they're going to try to have one agent to kind of do everything to minimize, you know, how, all, all the difficulties of doing that. So I think the next couple of years, you're going to see a really big uh, convergence of, you know, my antivirus uh, agent can, can, can install my patch and, and configure me and, and, and things like that. So that's going to be in the OS, right? Uh, uh, Windows has got uh, uh, the Defender uh, product in there now, you know, and so on. So you're going to see a lot of that convergence over the next couple of years, in my in my opinion. So uh, what you're not going to see is, um, I, I think, an increase in. Well, I, I don't want to be critical too much. I, I'm pretty sure about the other other trends, like I just said. So I'm sure other people have other ideas what they're what they think is coming, right? No. Well, uh, I'm involved in the CIS uh, Solaris 10 benchmark update, which we're just getting going on again, and had some discussions with NIST and DISA, and they're trying to come out with a common enumeration for issues, because if you saw that page I had of NIST compliance issues and DOD compliance issues, I can also give you headaches with the PCI ones, the ISO 27002 ones, and lists and lists, and now SAN's coming out with yet another list, and they can drive anybody crazy trying to make sure you've mapped to all of these lists. So they're trying, I think, they say so anyway, to consolidate this with a common enumeration and come up with some consensus that will hopefully make it easier. I don't know how far down the road that's going to be. Just I'd like another comment there. Everybody talked about risk calculations at this conference a couple different times. What we haven't seen is a standard way to calculate risk. So you know, if you have one computer with a thousand vulnerabilities, or a thousand computers with one vulnerability, uh, which one's more risky? You know, you walk around here, you're going to get a, you'll, you'll get fist fights over the dating app, you know, and, and throw in cloud computing. But at the end of the day, how do you count risk for something like that? Is, you just, is it just raw vulnerability counts? Is it, is it, is it the, the complexity of the systems and, and, and different things like that? I tend to really talk about variance. You know, if you have a random set of configurations on your network, um, that's increased cost in maintaining it, increased in cost of securing it, increased cost in coming up with ways to protect it. And if you can minimize the variance, you save cost in, across the board just from IT and the response and different things like that. So if people start thinking like that, uh, you know, it's definitely, it, it, there's definitely a trend like that. But, you know, if you walked into your, your CTO and said, we got to minimize variance, it's going to look at you know, like, what, what article are you reading? You know, no, one's, no one's talking about that. But that's really what's going on behind the scenes. Gene Kahneman and the Visible Ops folks are huge about that scenario. I mean, they're, they're, I think that uh, there's a good point there and it's starting to get traction in the security community. So if you can use VMs to track the drift and the variance, I think that that's very helpful. Absolutely. But some of this is also to get the different business units together to come to some consensus so that throughout the organization you've got some standards and reduce some of the redundancy and redundant processes. And that's a lot harder to achieve than it sounds because if you get into a very large organization like I was on Wall Street, the organizations don't want to talk to each other, don't want information from another organization. Not invented here is a big feeling. So um, not an easy solution for that unless it comes down from executive management. We're going to standardize. But then you get organizations that are like, but we're special. We have special needs, and we're not going to use whatever systems you guys are saying. So, um, well, it's OK if you have special needs. You just say, fine, you're going to accept this risk, and we'll bubble it up to the CEO. So when you get hacked into and everything's stolen, we'll say, we presented this, and you decided to accept the risk, so now you accept the responsibility. Yeah, and then you have to have a reason why you're de deviating from the standard. Um, working on the CIS benchmark, which is a consensus from a lot of different people, we're first going through uh, from a Sun, DISA, uh, NIST, and the CIS people on what we're saying you need to come up with for a standard for Solaris 10 systems. Then it goes out to the Greek choir, all the people who are on the consensus benchmark. And that's going to go on for probably months, because people will say, no, 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 we want to make sure you change your password five times. And somebody else is like, yeah, well, if you're still looking at password security, you've missed the boat. And there's going to be a lot of tech arguments back and forth. And that's just one consensus. So it's difficult to get to that. It um, will make life a lot easier.
And if you can do it in your organization, by all means, come up with standards. Um, anything else? Okay. Do you have any other comments, Ron? Okay. Um, as I said, we're working on this paper. Uh, it's, as it started out, it was just a way for me to get my ideas together for this, and it's turned into 24, 25 pages, um, some of which has that nasty-looking table that you saw that hopefully isn't as frightening as it looks. I think there's a lot of good information in there. But if anybody's interested in seeing a copy of it, just grab my business card or send me some email. And uh, I think we'll also put it on the source site when we decide where we're sticking it on the Tenable site. And uh, people can download it. I've got to do some editing on it still. Um, download it, and please send comments, thoughts on what you think works, what you think doesn't work, and maybe you'll find it useful in your organization. So thanks very much for coming. Ms. Shirley. I know, I talk too fast. Hmm?